Now, one in four Americans being affected by mental health issues, it is incredibly important that we break through the stigma and to talk about what we can do to help. So next, Stephen Chan will be discussing newest breakthroughs in technology to give people comprehensive individual care. And to all those who may be suffering silently, you are not alone. Please welcome to the stage, Stephen Chan. Who here has been inside a hospital before? Y'all have been because you were born one, right? How many have you? How many have uh, been or visited to uh, a psychiatric hospital? Okay, a couple of them. So imagine that you're in a psychiatric hospital. It's a psychiatric ward, and it's not like you see in the uh, TV or the movies, t television shows. Imagine a place that's like a hospital, except it's much calmer. There are no wires, there are no devices, there's nothing that people can strangle themselves with or trip over. Um, it's a calming environment with gardens, very sort of bland and boring environment. And imagine you're the medical student on the service in the psych unit. You hear your name being called out. In my case, it was Steve Chan, Steve Chan, Steve Chan. And I turned around and I saw one of my friends there. And I was wondering, what is she doing here? And so this brings me to my first case. This was actually one of my friends who was uh, actually studying for her MCATs at the time. She was an undergraduate and she raced up to me, asked me all sorts of uh, probing questions about my relationship, and then raced off to the bathroom, took a toothbrush out, brushed her teeth for the tenth time, then raced out, took out her MCAT books, ruffled through the uh, pages which weren't highlighted, and then asked me questions about her bunny rabbits, then started crying, and then raced off to another part of the room. She was manic. She had something called mania. And she was there because the police arrested her, 3 a.m. in the morning. She was banging pots and pans on the doors of her neighbors. And so they took her in for a psychiatric evaluation. Um, but what touched me about this case was that her brain was so overactive, so wired, uh, um, uh, so overwired, and uh, she was so energetic. I tried to normalize it. She was crying a lot. She was, uh, I, I felt like I, I I wanted to be there for her and try to normalize her experience. And I didn't realize that, look, this could happen to any of us. And, you know, and, uh, and I was there to just support her. I wasn't her doctor at the time. So uh, if you're wondering what we think of as doctors, we think about all sorts of numbers, all sorts of vital signs, heart rate, breathing rate, temperature, um, you know, a lot of lab tests. And we chart it over time, left to right. You know, it could be day to day, hour to hour, sometimes month to month. Um, but we can also do this for mood, too. We don't often do this for mood. If you take a chart from happy to sad, you know, oftentimes most of us, I would say, live in the neutral zone. Now we have happy moments, we have sad moments, um, but for some of us, we actually get very depressed. We feel very down, and that's something we call unipolar depression. Unipolar meaning one side of this line, and there are all sorts of symptoms, just a few highlights. You feel down, you feel no pleasure in life, and at its worst, you don't feel like life is worth living anymore. Some people have a more severe form of depression called bipolar depression. Bi meaning two sides of this line, where you also experience something like unipolar depression. We call it bipolar depression. But because it can straddle both sides of the line, it can go up into hypomania, people who are very energetic, very creative, talking very fast, so much what I'm doing. And then people who become, at its worst, manic, and their brain is overactive, overexcited. They may feel euphoric, meaning overly happy. They may, feel de they may be delusional. They may hear things or see things that aren't real. And their brain may be overactive. Right? So I didn't realize how important this was and if you, uh, to just those of us who don't typically experience mental health issues, uh, even risk factors and physical things that we face from in our daily lives, allergies, poor sleep, poor diet, smoking, stress, all of that can affect inflammation that can affect depression as well. If you, uh, I put you at risk for depression. Um, in 
the United States, mental health is a huge deal. It's at the top of the list for U.S. disability-adjusted years, along with neurological disorders. And I also highlighted at the bottom self-harm and interpersonal violence. And we talked, I think, uh, one of our speakers talked earlier about you know, the interpersonal violence that we may have in relationships as well. Um, in America, one in five people face some sort of mental health condition in a given year. Um, so if you look around the room, that's 20% of us. You'll, you probably will find you know, someone who's going through a difficult time. Uh, but in, within the Asian American community, this is even more pronounced. Asian American women, for instance, have the highest rates of depressive symptoms versus any racial or ethnic or gender group. They have a higher number of suicides as well. 15 to 24 die from suicide at a higher rate. Now this is not just for younger women, but also older women who are over the age of 65 um, due to acculturation issues, you know, isolation, language barriers, and not you know, being comfortable where they are, transport issues. And among Southeast Asians, numbers are even higher. Um, major mood disorders, 71%, like depression. And you notice that at the bottom of the slide, it says Hmong people face a much higher rate of depressive issues and mood issues. Hmong people are from the mountainous regions of Laos, Thailand, Vietnam, and uh, China. And when they immigrated here, they faced all sorts of barriers because of they were fleeing wartime trauma. Uh, but when they got here to the United States, they faced language barriers. They faced stigma, racism, bias, and a health system that really was not uh, sensitive to their needs. And this led to a lot of issues with them getting access to treatment, less likely to receive treatment, and lower rates of health insurance, too. So a lot of issues that they face as well, and I see this in my uh, kid, my child patients, too. One of the cases I've seen is a young child who got straight A's, they went um, through school just fine, they met all their developmental milestones. And so they're healthy, but they started hearing voices, seeing things. Um, they tried to get rid of the voices in their head by, um, by, trying to, by being physically violent. And uh, the, the, the good news is that we at least got a hold of the schizophrenia, the positive symptoms, the hallucinations with medicine, they, that those stabilized. The unfortunate part was what was left of this were, was the social stigma, the social anxiety that uh, she faced. So, you know, can, I, told, I mentioned earlier that she was a straight-A student, she was uh, doing well, her mom wanted her to, to do big things. She faced a lot of pressures from her tiger mom, you know. Uh, you're, you've heard of the tiger mom uh, over, you know, parenting, strict parenting, where there's a lot of expectations set upon children. Um, this was a Time Magazine uh, cover a few years ago. But it wasn't just these expectations that affected her. It was also the external societal, societal expectations, external pressure. Um, we talk, uh, I mean, Pam talked about perfectionism too. This is a, one form of perfectionism where society says, look, you're Asian American, you must be happy. Look at all the smiling kids on the Time Magazine cover. You must be great at computers. You must be great at reading books and holding a basketball. So this was actually a cover three decades ago. Can you believe it? Time Magazine, three decades ago, this was the cover, 1987. And this is still being talked about within the Asian American community as well. You know, where does this all come from? Well, this is a table from um, cultural psychiatry, and it talks about how different religions influence Asian cultures. Confucianism, respect for authority, self-development, scholarship. If you're not reading a book, you're not, you know, you're not doing your job. Um, Buddhism, you know, a lot of the reason why we don't seek help is because we feel like we deserve it. You know, it's, it's, Buddhism is where you feel like human life is full of sorrows, you, um, you kind of deserve what is coming to you. You know, these are some of the beliefs that underlie some of the Asian culture that prevents uh, many people from getting the care that they need. Um, and, the, and I talked about the external sort of pressures that, we, that Asian Americans face. There's that myth of the model minority, right? That the Asian Americans are the model minority because they do so well. But the reality is that a lot of, uh, almost a majority of them, uh, well, 40%, don't finish high school. Um, you know, in the most recent market collapse, uh, 
Asian American Pacific Islanders suffered the largest percentage of foreclosures of any racial group. And I'll read this out because I don't think you can see this. From 2007 to 2010, Asian American Pacific Islanders had the highest share of long-term unemployment. Unemployment of any racial group. So I don't know where the model minority comes from if we're all unemployed and we're not finishing high school and we're, not, we're getting, our houses are being taken away. You know, so that's, you know, that's the reality that we face. You know, we're, tr we're expected to do well. We're expected to get management positions, to be leaders. Yet, if you look at this chart, the arrows that will show up, whoop, there we are. Asians are Asian men and women in US science and engineering jobs. Lowest number of managerial positions versus other ethnic groups. Um, some business consultants have written about this. They call this the bamboo ceiling, you know, because we talk about the glass ceiling. Glass ceiling is where, um, you know, women and fem you know, cannot reach those higher managerial positions. Similar thing with Asians is something called the bamboo ceiling. Um, perfectionism, we talked about this earlier, and that can lead to a lot of issues. Obsessive compulsive personality, which is different from obsessive compulsive disorder. Eating disorders, when you feel like you're not pretty, you're not good enough, you're, you're not thin enough. Depression and social anxiety, which is something I've faced myself. 15 years ago, I can tell you, I can promise you, you would not see me on the stage. But I had to force myself to overcome this perfectionism and fear of not uh, being rejected. So this is uh, something that I feel like a lot holds us back as well. And there are a lot of resources for this. Uh, and then even at its worst, you know, this is something I see in my patients. Are they really depressed? Have, do they have suicidal plans? Like they desire to uh, harm themselves or, and they're doing drugs and they're using alcohol. Those are the, th the warning signs. And I'm mentioning this so that you can know if you see this about this, if you see this within yourself or if you see this within your colleagues or your friends as well. Um, so that was a lot of the bad news. That's, those are a lot of the problems. But the good news is that there's a lot of people who are working on this. And I feel like since we're all entrepreneurs, innovators, really empowered people, that we can all like, try to do something about this issue of mental health within the Asian American community and the American community. Um, I am a physician at UC Davis. And we have a, 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 pro a program called the Transcultural Wellness Center. And this is Dr. Henry Tan. He's a UCSF trained psychiatrist. And psychiatrists, we are physicians for the mind, brain, and body. And he actually put together a program that works with Hmong, Laotian, Vietnamese, Koreans, Chinese people, all sorts of people who speak the same language for those immigrant populations who are facing a difficult time uh, over in the Sacramento region. I, I, I am able to learn from folks like Dr. Russell Lim. Russell Lim is a, an expert on cultural psychiatry who has spoken about Asian, Latino, uh, African, and LGBT mental health issues. Um, one of my coworkers, Pachita Lo, she is uh, a co-resident with me, and she is the first Hmong female psychiatrist in the nation. She's the first. And I am really grateful that she and I are in the same you know, same program, and she's training alongside with me. Um, and I bring her up as, a, as an example. She's Hmong, and her parents were the reverse of this perfectionistic ideal. Her parents discouraged her from going to medical school. Her parents didn't want her to go to medical school. They didn't want her to become a doctor. They wanted her to stay at home and take care of the kids. And she's defying them. She's now, she's transcended that, and she's following her dreams. So the, it's not just the, uh, issue of Asian Americans as a model minority, but also the fact that we are such a diverse people that not all of us are the same. We all have our own individual and cultural needs, too. Um, professional business coaches, such as my, uh, one of my colleagues, Preston Nee, has been talking about Asian American and women communication, female communication issues in the workplace. And even the popular press has been talking about this. Um, language issues among Asian, uh, older Asian women uh, as well as highlighting UC Davis's work in um, the Asian population as well. They, and so I see this, I see a lot of these issues with uh, my patients. Um, and one of, my, one of the final cases I wanted to discuss was uh, a woman I saw who was facing, uh, her, her, her boyfriend actually took her in to get evaluated. And she said that her, um, her boyfriend actually was um, controlling her a lot, 
was very abusive, emotionally abusive. He had several restraining orders against him from other ex-girlfriends and he was, to intimidate her, he was destroying property in front of her, punching walls, uh, and even looking through her smartphone, call logs, messages, and all the um, sites that she's visiting. So I was like, well, he hasn't threatened you yet, but this is, these are all huge risk factors for domestic violence. Can we come up with some kind of technological solution to help you escape? You know, because her phone was what, all she had at this moment. She didn't have any money. So there I was, after hours, in the clinic, helping her find and download Android apps to hide her phone call logs and her messages so that she can punch in a secret code and then, boop, she can call for housing. She can call for a women's shelter. You know, can we use technological solutions that, to extend the reach of, you know, the really, really frayed services that we have in mental health and society, too? There are a lot of apps that are being created right now, a lot of platforms and a lot of devices. And I think that this is something that we can all look at. Telemedicine, video visits, devices. And I, I'm all, this is being tweeted on, online too, so if you wanted to, can grab the slide. But last year, a good majority of mental health startups were created in 2015. Um, so there's a huge opportunity because the system is so fragmented. You know, there are even experts that are getting into the space trying to find out what they can do for depression and schizophrenia. The head of the National Institute of Mental Health, for instance, Thomas Insel here, joined Google's uh, life sciences arm and he writes that technology can cover much of the diagnostic process and it can help with treatments and interventions and it can be done through a smartphone. Smartphones can detect mood, smartphones can help with um, making sure that you're not near a bar even if you have an alcohol addiction uh, issue. Um, even uh, smartphones have video games that can teach you uh, techniques on how to reframe your negative thoughts as well. There are also um, virtual reality apps that are being created to help with alcohol use, PTSD, anxiety issues, um, fake humans that can talk to you and can coach you through things and recognize your uh, emotions. Um, I'm going to actually just briefly say that there are even um, augmented reality applications that my colleagues are working on to help detect and help ki little kiddos with autism you know, make eye contact because they cannot read social cues. Um, there are, I'm going to actually skip over this as well, there are also wearable technologies in clothing. Uh, one of my co uh, colleagues actually at UC Davis is the first fashion design professor in the entire UC system, Helen Ku, and she's working on uh, clothing that can show off your mood too and also help little children with autism who cannot express themselves uh, through um, sensors and little toys on their clothing. The project I'm working on is a video visit uh, telemedicine program that I'm working on with under the vision of Dr. Peter Yellowlees at UC Davis, where the video is actually routed to a psychiatrist later. And so we call this asynchronous. Asynchronous meaning not at the same time. So the, t so the doctor doesn't have to be there at the same time. Really groundbreaking stuff. Um, and then there's some artificial intelligence things that people are working on as well. So I feel like here we have a huge opportunity to work on this uh, because the systems are so, so fragmented that we could all put our brains together and work on uh, improving the mental health of everybody. So I just wanted to end with what happened with the, my friend who I saw. I remember she was the one, um, the young Chinese undergraduate who came in with, uh, in the throes of mania. And here was her recovery. So she, her mood was high, right? She was really excited. She was really, really revved up. And with the help of medicines, mood stabilizers, uh, she, she calmed down more. She went through talk therapy. And she also went through the calming environment of the hospital. And then after her mood stabilized, she left the hospital. And I met, her up, for her, met up with her for coffee a couple months later. She said something that was really poignant to me. She said, you know, when it comes to her condition, I'm afraid that I'll have an episode one day where I never recover, though. It's a really scary thought. It's kind of like cancer in a way. So cancer. Cancer is something that was really taboo two decades ago, three decades ago. HIV and AIDS. You didn't want to talk to anyone who had HIV or AIDS three decades ago. 
So mental health is where right now that conversation is. Let's make it not taboo. Let's make it so that we can know the signs and symptoms, know where to go for help, and then also normalize it and talk about it. Thank you.